So um, before we get too far, I, I thought this talk was tomorrow, so I don't have as many cat pictures as I normally do, and I, I just want you to know that I, I still love you all. Um, it's just the cat pictures are always a finishing touch that I added the morning of, and I just didn't have the time to do that today. So I'm really sorry. Um, if, if you're feeling a miss of cat pictures, uh, reach out to me, and I'll forward some along to you. Uh, so yeah, I'm Holden. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her. It's tattooed on my wrist, which is really convenient in case I forget. Um, and I'm a developer advocate at Google. Uh, it's pretty nice. They pay me money. I like money. Um, I am on the Spark PMC. This is really nice. It's like a really shitty version of tenure. Um, because it doesn't guarantee pay, but it is pretty much impossible to get rid of me. Um, so I like it um, because I'm lazy. Um, and I contribute to other projects, but I'm not like uh, PMC so much. Um, I've been at a, a bunch of other companies as well, uh, IBM, Alpine, Databricks, Google. I'm a co-author of two Spark books. The second Spark book is the one where I get much better royalties. Um, so I definitely encourage everyone to buy that book. Um, it is more or less unrelated to today's presentation, but that should not stop you from buying it. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, SlideShare, stuff like that. If anyone's interested in learning more about how the Apache Spark development and code review process goes, I've started doing live stream code reviews, and you can sort of see how this goes. Um, and maybe I can help convince some of you to contribute to Spark. We're not all scary people. Some of us are quite nice and have wonderful stuffed animals like Boo. Um, and we want to help you out. In addition to who I am professionally, I'm trans, queer, Canadian, and part of the leather community. Um, once again, this is also not related to this talk particularly. There is no secret Canadian garbage collector. Um, that joke went over much better the first time I made it today. Um, so perhaps some repeat attendees. Uh, but I, I think it's important to remember that we're all from different backgrounds. And if we work together, we can make really cool things. But if we spend all of our time fighting with each other, we're just going to burn the world down with really shitty data products. Um, and this is especially relevant to those of you doing machine learning. And uh, that's great. Also, um, today is a primary election day. I am not a US citizen. I'm here on an H-1B visa. It is terrifying. Um, if you are a US citizen and SF resident, you can go vote in the primary. And that would be lovely. Um, even if you haven't registered, there's a way to do it um, with a provisional ballot. Uh, please vote for people who don't hate me. Um, hopefully that's not too controversial. San Francisco, just on a bit of a side note, is the first place I've ever really felt comfortable in my life. And so please, if, if you are in San Francisco, like put in the effort to vote. There's no guarantee that we'll continue to have wonderful accepting government if we don't uh, vote. Or, well, you don't vote. I want to be clear, I've never voted here. No voter fraud has occurred. Anyways, okay, so hopefully you're nice. Um, you're probably pretty familiar with Spark. Is anyone new to the Spark community? Welcome, friends! Yay! I'm so excited you're here. Um, this is probably not a great introduction talk for the Spark ecosystem. Um, we're going to go and learn some of the, like, kind of more esoteric bits today. Um, but hopefully, this will show you some of the cool things you can do, and then you can go and learn some other fun things as well. Definitely also buy my books. OK. Um, so there's a bunch of different things that are going on here. Um, there's accelerating raw Spark, uh, sorry, accelerating raw TensorFlow on top of Spark with Apache Arrow, which is probably what most people are here for. Um, and then there's a bunch of like sort of future looking things where we try and do it differently and none of them work. But we're also going to look at those because I think they're really interesting from a future sort of facing point of view uh, to see what we might do in the future. Wow, people keep showing up. Hi, new humans. Okay, um, so we'll look at TensorFlow on Spark. I'm also going to look at TensorFlow on Beam plus Spark. Do not worry, that does not work. So it will be a very short section. Um, We'll talk about how Apache Arrow changes everything, um, big air quotes. And um, yeah, we'll talk a lot about how things could be better and uh, how to make this happen. Um, so before we get too far, and, and sorry this is a repeat for those of you who are at my 
two o'clock session today. I was hoping you'd have at least 24 hours to forget. Um, it's important to understand how PySpark works, because if we want to get access to the really cool TensorFlow stuff, the easiest way to do that is to go through Python. Even if we're writing in Scala, Python is probably going to be our intermediary helping us out talking to the TensorFlow libraries for us. So PySpark works with pickling, sockets, pipes, and JSON. And if that sounds terrible and slow, you are correct. If that sounds like an excellent design, perhaps you're the person who looked at this design and replicated it for R. R. Or the person who did it for C Sharp or Julia. And the list goes on. OK. Um, so PySpark, kind of interesting, has some serious performance hurdles, uh, which really impact us when we want to start doing deep learning, uh, because we end up going through Python. And so the general architecture looks something like this. We have our data. Um, it lives in the JVM. Uh, we have our cool functions. They live in Python. And so we take our cool functions on our driver program, we serialize them, hand them over to the JVM, and the JVM goes, I don't know, what the hell is this? Um, and so then it goes and it gives it to some other JVMs, which also have no idea what we've asked them to do. So they just take our functions, copy them into Python, and say, good luck. And then the Python process takes over and goes, hey, where's my data? And then the JVM is like, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. And it starts sending the data. And that's really slow, um, because we have to essentially copy the data an extra time. And if we're doing this with TensorFlow, we copy the data into Python, and then we go, OK, cool. So I'm going to take my function, set up TensorFlow, and copy it into TensorFlow. And now my data has many hops. And while each one of these hops as a cloud provider is great, I sell you CPU hours, as a cloud customer is perhaps not what you want, or even as just a regular customer. Like, you probably don't want to just spend all of your time copying data. As exciting as that may be, you're probably not incentivized to just make copies of your data. If you are, please let me know. This architecture is perfect for you. Um, and I think it's also important to point out, sometimes when I give that diagram, people are like, wow, Spark sucks. Um, and yes, Spark does suck, but so does Flink. And um, so does pretty much everything else. Uh, the notable exceptions here are there's like pure Python implementations, but then they don't work with anything else, so they're not very useful either. Um, so everything is terrible, and that's our key takeaway. So even though the things we're going to talk about today kind of suck, uh, be assured the grass is not actually greener on the other side. The grass is also a pile of manure. OK. Um, so this impacts us with a double serialization cost. Error messages make no sense. And since we're talking about people who are trying to do stuff with TensorFlow, another important part is dependency management makes limited amount of sense. Um, this is important. TensorFlow is really cool. Um, but it has this library, and it's not part of Spark. And so if I want to deploy it, I actually have to deploy some packages to my cluster. And I, I want to do this in a somewhat intelligent way. I don't want to just like SSH to all of my cluster nodes, install TensorFlow, and then like run it. Then in like you know six months or whatever, when I want to try out a new version of TensorFlow, I have to go and do that again. And then also if I find out it was bad, I'm in a really awkward state. And so this dependency management situation is kind of unfortunate. Um, but let's let's stop focusing on things that are bad. Let's look at TensorFlow on Spark. Um, now. I assure you, um, even though the first example is not word count, we will get to word count. Um, but since this is big data and TensorFlow, I figured I would do the modern equivalent of word count, MNIST. Um, and so we can see here, we can make this really simple TF cluster. Um, and then we can just train uh, our, our fun function. And it's, it looks really simple and really easy. The only problem is it's going to be really slow um, and not very reliable. But let's focus on the slow part, because the reliable part is going to be a lot harder to fix. Um, that's the thing which is actually being discussed on the mailing list if you want to come and join us. Uh, there's an SPIP discussion around how to make the scheduling more reliable. But the first thing that we could do is realize if we're copying the data three times, it's probably worth investigating how to make that less bad. Um, so let's, let's go down this path. 
Ooh, Apache Arrow. Your code can be as happy as this cat. Not a guarantee. Um, and we're going to talk about it mostly in the context of Python today because TensorFlow. But it's important to note that like, you can also use this to directly copy stuff into GPUs as well. Um, so it's cool. So there's a vendor benchmark. It implies that it could be somewhere between 3 and 242 times faster. That is a lie. Um, sorry, not a lie. Oh, fuck. I really want to make this joke, but I probably shouldn't because I don't have a green card. But insert a joke here. Uh, moving on. OK. I really still hope I can get that green card. OK. Um, so what does Arrow look like? What does our faster magical interchange world look like? It looks really cool. Um, we live in Java because JVM and Spark, and our data lives there. And so we can go into Arrow format, and then from the Arrow format, a whole bunch of different systems can understand it. Um, and one of them has a very, yeah, ish means no, but could. Um, so R and Python and also NVIDIA CUDA people um, can understand the arrow format without having to explicitly change it. So this is really awesome. Um, and it's cool. And if you were maybe just adding two numbers together as sort of a, the first step in your deep learning pipeline, uh, this is what it would look like. You would switch your UDFs from register function to calling something called pandas UDF. And then we can add two numbers together, which is what Python is good at, numeric computation at its finest. Um, generally speaking, the JVM is well known for not being trusted with integer addition. Okay, that, that, that was a bad joke. Okay, okay. Um, but the cool thing is we could actually do this inside of TF on Spark and we would get these cool benefits. Now, you could tell yourself that you're going to get a 3 to 242 times faster speed up. Does anyone believe we're going to get that? I have a car to sell you later. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn it. OK, um, so relatedly, we, we do not get a 3 times speed up. Um, but we, we, we get a speed up. And so that's cool. Oh, right. The, the other slight downside is um, there's this thing where it becomes uh, less reliable. Um, but that is a detail that we can gloss right over. And moving on. OK, so what happens inside? Um, our do train function switches into this at pandas UDF. And it takes in some integer. Or no, it returns an integer. And the integer is a dummy type um, that we're returning. Uh, and there's a comment that says sad hack for now, which is also how you know this is the one piece of the code that will not change in five years. Um, and this is actually pretty cool. The, the downside is we use Arrow for the first part. So we are able to use Arrow to get our data from Spark into Python, but then when we go ahead to go and take our data from Python into TensorFlow, then we just go and kind of shove it under the corner and call it done. Because um, it doesn't quite work so good yet. But that's OK. It's, it's a start. Um, and then we return some dummy values, because when I tried returning empty, it uh, had a uh, exception. <laughs> Whatever. Returning dummy values is totally fine and normal. And, and zero could indicate success. Success. OK. So what does this high quality architecture look like? Um, OK, actually, the ish here does mean that, yeah, at least one third of the time when I run this, it fails. But only about a third, less than half. It's pretty solid software. I would definitely deploy this in production to someone else's company. Um, I no longer make my money on support contracts, but you can tell where I come from. <clears throat> um, so OK, Java copies the data into Arrow, copies it into Python, and then we just kind of look around, pretend no one's looking, copy it into TensorFlow, and some of the time TensorFlow just goes, who are you? What now? And then we just re-execute the job, because why not? Just put it in a try-catch loop. Um, and until we fix the, the scheduling issue for failures, that's pretty much what we're stuck with. Um, and please join us in the discussion on how to make this less terrible on the dev list. So there's a bunch of things that we could do to make this like nicer. Um, one of them is memory mapped arrow rather than shoving arrow over pipes. Um, in 
theory, we could like skip the Python hand touching the data part entirely, and we could like set up the channel in Python and then pass like this shared memory buffer that we got from the JVM and just assume that everything's all right and pass it into TensorFlow. Um, yeah, that has worked 0% of the time I've tried, so not, not doing that one. But V next means it could happen. So that's cool. But maybe, actually, how many users are Scala users in the house? Okay, this is a Spark conference. Pretty much anywhere else I get like two people. Um, actually, except for the Scala conference, which is in New York. Um, <laughs> then I get like five, and we have a part. No, I'm joking. Okay, so um, for all the Scala people, you're probably like, that's cool and all. You can make this thing run faster, but I can't use it. It's written in Python. I want to use this, um, and I don't want to learn Python, or I don't want to rewrite all of my code into Python. So the solution is multi-language pipelines. Yay! There is not a lot of excitement here. Um, so uh, the, maybe you read the bottom point where I said this is painful, but it's doable, and I can fit it on some slides, and so that's cool. Um, so one of the projects which does this is Sparkling ML. Um, and it has a logo that I got from Fiverr.com. Um, it's pretty great. The panda is having a pretty good time. Not as good a time as the cat. Um, and it's a place for like sort of the unwanted stepchildren of Spark machine learning to live. But it's also a place to do crazy things that no one will let me put inside of Spark, like multi-language pipelines. Yay! Um, so we can actually make our Python transformers, we can take all that shit that we just did, it's like not too complicated, and we can expose it to Scala users, and we can charge them money, or um, <clears throat> support contracts, or whatever it is, same thing. So how do we do this? So the first thing that we do is we have this magic incantation called startup.py. Um, and essentially, we specify a bunch of classes that look like what our Java, tra Java transformer classes are, look like. Um, we take some things to construct Python user-defined functions, reach deep inside the internals, grab out the Java representation, and hand it into Java, and just pretend that everything's okay. Um, and we have this other function, which starts the gateway in a really strange way. Um, and this is to allow us to like register callbacks in a way that Spark doesn't super happy support, unless you're in streaming mode. And if you try and do streaming deep learning on top of Spark, you better have a platinum support contract because that's not gonna that's not gonna work. Okay, um, all right. If you're really excited about boilerplate code, if like looking at those four things makes you go, yes, why didn't she put startup.py on a slide? Uh, there's a link here, and you can totally not click on it because it's. I should have put the text there, but I will upload the slides to my Twitter, and you can go, and then you can click on this link, and you can read startup.py. Um, but the like relevant parts is like we have this Python registration provider, and it provides a place for Spark to call, um, sorry, for Scala to call, and it says like, hey, what's up? Like, give me your Spark context and your session representation, the function name, and the parameters that you want to pass to this function. Encode is as a string. What could go wrong? <laughs> Many things, but that's okay. Um, and then just don't read this code, it's depressing. Um, oh yeah, okay. Um, and the print could not find function is because if we actually cause an exception inside of here, your life will turn into hell thanks to Pi4j. Um, just trust me on this one, you never want to do that again. Okay, <clears throat> so maybe boilerplate Java is your thing. Who loves Java Enterprise Beans? I misjudged this audience. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it's boring. It's in a few files if anyone wants to look either. It essentially is the corresponding Java classes. Um, so I did promise there was going to be word count, and this is our first word count example. And I think it's time that we savor this word count, look back and reflect on everything it can teach us. I'm not sure what that is, but it's apparently very instructional, which is why we put it everywhere. Um, and so you can see here we have an input series. We tokenize all of the elements, and it's fun. Yay! Okay, so this is pretty basic, and it's not deep learning, although Spacey could be deep learning if your investors were a little drunk when they were signing the term sheet. Um, 
but it's pretty cool because Java NLP toolkits, uh, how do you say this politely, are bad um, for the most part. They're not all bad, but they don't have the same range of functionality that we can get from our wonderful Python friends, and we should steal their code. Um, and so this lets us tokenize non-English languages, which is really great, because once upon a time I had to do that, and it was my first job out of college, and I didn't realize there were languages without spaces, because I was not a very well-rounded tiny Holden. I guess probably tiny Holden was the same height. Okay, okay, don't worry. We can call it from the JVM. Yay! Huh. Okay, way less excitement about that. Um, I was considering doing this in Japanese so that we could see it actually provides functionality that we don't have here, but I don't speak Japanese, which is why my first job of internationalizing a pipeline to Japanese was like an interesting choice. Um, but okay, so this can be kind of how it looks. Ooh, Spark SQL, do, 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 do. Yay! Okay. So that's fine. You're probably all here for deep learning, and that's all right. It makes me sad, but it's all right. But we can take the same technique that we just did for Spacey and apply it to deep learning, and so many cool things will happen. It'll be amazing. Um, Spark deep learning pipelines are another option um, besides TensorFlow on Spark. We could do this with TensorFlow on Spark, but I wanted to use another one of the libraries just because none of them pay me money, <coughs> and I want to give them all equal treatment until one of them does. So, okay, maybe you've looked at the uh, deep image predictor thing. Um, and it takes a bunch of arguments. It's, it's a transformer class inside of Python. Um, and this is kind of cool. And so what we do is instead of returning a UDF, because it turns out it's really annoying to turn this into a UDF for, for reasons um, that are quite boring, uh, we instead return a function, uh, well, we return a class which has one function inside of it that we actually care about. So we can make this transform df function, which just goes ahead and calls the normal transform function inside. Um, and in our Scala side, we can make all of the parameters that we had in the Python side, except I'm lazy, so I only put in the mandatory parameters, but you could put in all of the parameters if you wanted to. So model name, um, Actually, yeah, that's really the only required parameter. The input column and output column are inherited from basic Python transformer. Um, we have some name. We have a Python function name so that we can go into Python and ask for it. We have a copy function. Um, and then we have this high quality serialization with strings. Huh. We serialize it as a Python array as strings and just pass it to Python. And then back here, um, What's actually happening, oops, is that uh, we call a val. And uh, I mean, the val part is hidden in the base class, because I like to put all of my terrible things in my base class, so I can pretend that I'm a good person. And we just call a val on this, and then we set args to it, and then we pass it through. So we can set pretty much whatever we want this way. It's really cool. Um, it's pretty basic. Um, oh yeah, and the transform schema, that part was actually, that, that part is a TLDR, uh, that don't work, so we'll skip that one. Um, <clears throat> the schema part for now I didn't actually handle properly, but you totally could handle the schema properly. There's nothing inherent about it, it's just annoying to do because in Python we don't have the same schema information, so you have to manually specify the schema for each one. Um, and by in Python, I mean in Python ML, we don't have the same schema information. So that's cool, but another possible future would be the one we were talking about earlier, is we could just cut Python out, sort of, right? We could pass around this memory buffer instead. We didn't do that, but it's a thing we could do, and it would probably perform a lot better. Um, other options include using DL4J. Are there any DL4J users in the house? Two. That is lower than I expected. So DL4J actually has Arrow integrated inside of it, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm like 50% sure it works. Uh, have you gotten DL4J with Arrow to like work? Cool, I'm 100%, well, okay, I'll go 80%, 80? 
75% sure that it works. Okay, so pretty solid. So DL4J is another thing, um, and you can use it, and it doesn't have Python uh, to the nearly the same degree. Uh, another option, cool. So I'm gonna tell you something which most people probably don't say very often, I don't know. Um, and this is TensorFlow isn't enough on its own, right? Um, vendors may wanna sell you things that like don't require pre-processing. That's just a way of saying my framework doesn't support pre-processing. Um, Cause almost everyone's data needs some amount of pre-processing. Um, and so there's a bunch of things that we could do. Uh, one of them is TFX, but I'm running low on time. And so we could use Beam on top of Spark, on top of Java, and then a bunch of shit would happen underneath. Uh, TF transform is for pre-processing your data. It's pretty cool. It does not work on open source Spark today, um, but we are actively working on trying to make it uh, work there. And this is how it can look in Python and we can train a bunch of analyzers and do like quantile stuff and all of this happy things and have integrated pipelines. Um, if anyone's really interested in helping make Beam on top of Spark work so they can use TF Transform, um, please come and find me. I would be very happy and my boss would be very happy uh, and some random people on a mailing list would be pretty happy too. Uh, they're nice people. Um, and it sort of works on top of Flink right now, but this is Spark Summit, so it's probably less cool. Um, but yeah, so the future. The future may or may not come. Right, and yeah, so uh, TensorFlow is Python. Okay, uh, I've only got two minutes, so we're gonna skip these references, but if anyone's interested, just come find my Twitter. Um, if you wanna come hang out with me in Berlin, I will be there on Sunday. Uh, for a week, and New York the week after. Um, <clears throat> if anyone wants an excuse to visit Amsterdam, PyData is an excellent conference and definitely related to whatever field you're in. Uh, and they're, they're actually really sweet people. I love them a lot. And I'll do a bunch of other shit too. Um, so this is K-Thanks Bye, just because I've got two minutes left. Uh, and I'm gonna take a picture of people before you run out so I can tell my boss that you showed up. And you should totally pay my expense reports. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank, thank you all for not running away as soon as I put this slide up. I, I appreciate you. Um, I don't know, do we have time for questions or should I just take them in the hall wearing my, what? Okay, we've got time for a few questions if anyone has them. There's a microphone thing here and there's a human with a microphone. Does anyone have a question? No one. Oh, yay, question! Uh, hey, um, so I actually thought that was pretty interesting, um, and I want to use multi-language pipelines or see if it's the right fit. Is yay. there like a link that I can follow? Yeah, Sparkling ML. Um, okay. I will tweet a link to Sparkling ML and this slide deck, and you can come and try and join me in this crazy adventure. Thank you. Thank you.